It was about two months ago that I got a text from a friend saying, hey, do you by any chance have any of your old cheer uniforms still? I'm going to a costume party and I would really love to be able to borrow one um, while I go to that party. So I had a few reactions to that text message. Number one, obviously, I have all of my old cheer uniforms. <laughs> Duh. Um, two, I hate you that you're texting me that you can fit into my old cheer uniforms while I am like six months pregnant. And three, absolutely, yes, totally. That will be so fun to see you rocking some ANHS cheerleading wear. Yeah, do we have any Wolverines in the house? Oh, yeah, we do. We have some Wolverines in the house. Woo -woo. Okay, so with that, I asked my husband, hey, can you go up in the rafters and pull down this box that had all of my old cheer stuff in it? So up he went, he brought it down for me, and one night I sat in our living room and pulled everything out, and you know, it was just the walk down memory lane. You totally forget, like, oh my goodness, this was like my sophomore spring uniform, and this was like my junior winter uniform, and this one was what we wore for competitions, and, and so I had all these different uniforms spread out all over the floor. And my girls happened to walk in at that point in time, and their eyes got about this big, and they were like, what is all of this? And I was like, oh, these are all my old cheer uniforms. And they were like, what? And I realized at that point that I have never really shared with my girls who are now 12 and 11, so they're right at that age where they like love hearing all of these stories. I had never shared with them about my time as a cheerleader. So they were totally enthralled. What, what was this one for? And what was that one for? And, and what were the years that you did this? And how old were you? And what did you do? And they were so excited to sit and just hear the story of me being involved in cheer. Well, at the very bottom of that box was something that I had totally forgotten that I owned. And I saw it sitting at the bottom of the box and I gasped because I, I didn't know that I still had that. And so I pulled it out in very dramatic fashion. I mean, there may have been like, Mu like intense music playing in the background. And I pulled it out so that it was facing the girls and gave them a second to read what it said because on the back of that jacket, embroidered, it says national champion. And so it took the girls a second and they went, <gasps> what? And I instantly gained cool points. Like, it was so awesome. It was a great moment. Instantly gained cool points with my kids. And they said, you are a national champion? And I was like, well, yes, yes, I am. Let me tell you the story. <clears throat> and so I got to recount this whole story about how my senior year of high school, <clears throat> Our team went to Kissimmee, Florida, and we won the national championship. We won the title. And we were given these jackets. That was, part of, aside from the ginormous trophy that we won that still sits at ANA, uh, Lisa Nagel High School, um, we each got these own individual national champion jackets. <clears throat> Well, after telling them this story, we started putting everything in the box, in the bag for, to give to my friend who was gonna come pick the rest of the stuff up. And I went to fold up the jacket and put it back in the box. And my youngest daughter, Olivia, went, wait, mommy, can I have that? And for a split second, I was like, no, it needs to sit in the box. <laughs> what are you talking about? And then I thought, better of myself, and I was like, what am I doing? This thing has been sitting in here for like 20 years. Yes, sure, go ahead, you can have it. And so with pride and with the greatest of care, she slipped that jacket on, and she has proceeded to wear it at any given opportunity throughout the rest of the summer. And she beams with pride as she retells the story of how it is that she came to own this jacket. And as a mom, it's been so sweet for me to watch her be so eager to share a part of who I am and to share, to be so eager to tell other people about a legacy that I got to be a part of. Well, as we conclude these finishing chapters in the book of Ruth, it is my prayer that you and I will approach God's legacy of love with that same kind of eagerness as 
little children excited to put on the family jacket to show where it is that we've come from and whose legacy it is that we belong to. And I love the way that the Apostle Paul describes this in the book of Colossians. So turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter three. And we're gonna see how Paul articulates this putting on of the legacy of love. Colossians chapter three, We're going to go to verse 12 through 14. He says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So let's turn back now to the book of Ruth to look at chapters three and four of how this legacy of love concludes in this book of the Bible. And like I said, it's my prayer that we will, with that same kind of eagerness, put on the family jacket of love. Before we get started into chapter three, let's go ahead and just write point number one down on your outline. Let's do it. Love obediently. We're about to see Ruth display another aspect of Hesed, another aspect of this love that we have been adopted into, and it's obedience. So let's read now Ruth three, one through eight. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he has lied down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will, do, he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grass. Then as she came softly, then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Okay, so If you recall, where we left off in chapter two is that Ruth stayed with Boaz's women during not only the barley harvest, but it also mentions the wheat harvest. So she has now been there over the course of a few months working with his women and gleaning in his fields, which as we studied was way more than gleaning. She was really reaping the benefits of his hard work, of his servant's hard work and she was being very successful at it because of her hard work and determination and her hesed. So she's spent these few months now in this man's home, so to speak, in this man's company, in the company of his servants. So Naomi tells her, hey, that guy that you've been hanging around for the last two months, isn't he a redeemer? Go and wash yourself and go and lay down at his feet and he will tell you what to do. Naomi, or Ruth rather, responds in verse five by saying, all that you say I will do. What's kind of crazy about this is that the way that Naomi was asking Ruth to act was a little sketch, (laughs) right? It was just a little like, this is borderline and appropes what you're asking me to do here, Naomi. She asked her to bathe, to anoint herself, which means to put on perfume, to put on the cloak, so whatever it was that was her best garment that it was that she could wear, and then hide and wait till he fell asleep, then come lay down at his feet, put the covers up over his feet so that at some point he would wake up during the middle of the night with his feet being cold, and then see what happens. (laughs) Let's just go down there and carry that out. You know, in those days, the only type of woman that would hang around the threshing floor 
were those of less than desirable reputations. And yet, what Naomi is asking Ruth to do was not anything inappropriate, but it definitely required a level of trust and complete obedience. And Ruth went and, and did. Verse six, so she went to the thresh, she, wow, boom. She went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. This reminds me of what Jesus says in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3, the apostle John reiterates this. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And then he adds this line, and his commandments are not burdensome. Sometimes the way that God asks us to respond, to live a godly and upright life, in, to be a light in the darkness, is going to look like foolishness to the rest of the world, right? It's going to look a little weird, and yet we're told that obedience is a direct tie, a direct line, a direct overflow of our love for Jesus. And it's not just our love for Jesus, but it's showing our love of Jesus by obeying those that he's put in authority over us. So for most of us in the room, that's probably a husband. Are we being submissive? Are we obeying what they ask us to do? Are we doing it with a happy heart and a good attitude? What about if you work? Or what if you're not married yet? Your parents or your boss, the policeman, our government. Let us not forget that anyone that is in authority over us isn't just there willy-nilly, right? Jesus said, no one has authority unless it was given to him by me. And like we learned in last session, God is working everything out. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness. All things work together for good. So no matter who it is that God has placed in authority over us, let us show our love of him by being obedient. With the exception if they ask you to sin. If they ask you to disobey God, who our ultimate allegiance falls to, then we don't obey, right? But aside from that, we can show our love for God by being obedient to the people that he's placed in authority over us. And Ruth did that by obeying her mother-in-law, by obeying what her mother-in-law, it says, commanded her in verse six. Okay, so, so far we've seen that Ruth loves faithfully, we've seen her love humbly, and now we've seen her love obediently. And now is a really cool moment because we get to watch God reward her for this Hesed love that she has displayed. So point number two, put it down on your outline like this. Remember, God rewards humble love. When we are faithful to obey what he's asked us to do, when we are faithful to go and love him and love others, just like he has commanded us to do, he rewards us. Let's read how God rewarded Ruth in verses 9 through 18. Okay, so she's at his feet. She's uncovered his feet. And now at midnight, he startles, maybe a breeze swept through and his feet were cold. I don't know what happened, but he's startled. And then he gets even more startled because behold, a woman is laying at his feet. So he says, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. 
lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before anyone could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Again, another way of Boaz showing extravagant love. He's protecting her. He's even protecting her reputation. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Naomi said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. In this section of verses, we see God beginning the process of rewarding Ruth's humble love. It's pretty bold (laughs) what she does. In verse nine, when Boaz asks her, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. That was a marriage proposal. Because in those days, to spread your wing or to spread your garment or to cover someone else, when that was being said of like a man has covered a woman or when a man would say like, "I, I want to cover you or I want to spread my cloak over you, that was a way of saying, I want to marry you. I want to provide for you. I want to protect you. And so when Ruth says, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer, there's actually a twofold situation going on here with me, or going on here. Turn with me to chapter 2, verse 12. This is Boaz speaking to Ruth when he first explains why it is that he's showing her this extravagant love. And this is what he says. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz prays in that moment. He's, he's asking the Lord to repay Ruth for the kindness, for the steadfast love, that hesed that she has shown to Naomi. And the verbiage that he used, the verbiage that he uses is under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth now in chapter three, verse nine, is basically telling Boaz, be the answer to your own prayer. Be the answer to this prayer request. So not, it's a beautiful thing that she says here because not only is it a poetic way of proposing marriage, but it's recalling what he previously asked God to provide for her. And now she's coming to him saying, you do it. You be the one to do it. You are a redeemer. What's even crazier about this is that it's not really a request. She, it's said as a command. She doesn't say, will you please spread your wings over your servant? It's not like, will you marry me? It's like, marry me. That's crazy. And yet, what's even crazier is Boaz's response. He doesn't get offended. He's not mad about it. In fact, the opposite happens. And this is how he replies. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Boaz is shocked, flattered, by Ruth asking him to be the one to marry her. Commentators say that they believe this needed to happen because it's thought that Boaz was probably a generation older than Ruth. And also to be thought is that when Naomi commands Ruth to go and wash and put on your best cloak, that part of what that entailed was taking off the garments of mourning, 
that she had probably been wearing things that indicated that she was still in mourning over her late husband. And so by telling her to wash and put on the best thing that she has, and then by asking her to go be the one and propose or demand marriage, that she was then inviting Boaz in, letting, her, letting him know, this is what I want. He wouldn't have done that. One, the thought is because she was probably still in more, outwardly showing mourning, and two, because he was a full generation older than her. If you notice, he was probably in the same generation as Naomi. They both call Ruth my daughter. And that was something that was said of someone that could be like your parent. He is floored by her proposal. And what he says in verse 10 is, you have made this last kindness greater than the first. One guess, what's that word kindness? Hesed. Oh, come on. This is session three. That should be said with like, it's Hesed. It's Hesed. He's saying, you have made this display of steadfast love even greater than your first. What was her first display of Hesed, of Hesed steadfast love? It was that proclamation and that binding of herself to Naomi and to Naomi's God that she made initially. And now Boaz is saying, okay, now you've really outdone yourself. This is amazing because you haven't gone after young men, but you're showing your steadfast love to this family in the fact that you're asking to keep this marriage in the family because I'm a redeemer. In verse 11, he says, I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. What is so neat about this word worthy is that if you look at different translations, it can be translated in a few different ways. A few of the other ways that it's translated are you are a virtuous woman, you are a woman of noble character, you are an excellent woman. Do those words call to mind any other portion of scripture that we would tie that we would tie womanhood to proverbs yes I'm, yes there we go hesed proverbs 31 proverbs 31 this is a link to show that ruth displayed these aspects of a proverbs 31 woman and boaz is saying and everyone knows it you are a worthy woman proverbs 31 10 says and excellent wife who can find. And Boaz is saying, you are that excellent wife. You are that person. It's amazing, by the way, I would highly recommend in your personal study this week to do a study and parallel Ruth and the Proverbs 31 woman. It is so neat to see all the ways that Ruth fulfills this profile of a Proverbs 31 woman. And interestingly enough, in the old, uh, I believe it was the Hebrew translations of the Bible, it would be Proverbs and then Ruth came right after Proverbs. So you would read Proverbs 31 about this excellent wife and then you would immediately start the account of Ruth. They attributed these two to each other. She is that excellent wife. So God is blessing her in this humble love that she has shown by giving her a stellar reputation, by providing for her needs, and now by giving her the love of a man who, the, who this book also describes that he was a man of noble character. He's brought her a husband who is her equal. God rewards steadfast, humble love. To show this type of Hesed love like we've talked about these last 24 hours is costly. Let us not forget what we talked about at the beginning. She has been literally pouring out her blood, sweat, and tears for months on end to show this kind of faithful, sacrificial, humble, obedient love. This isn't something that just happened overnight. We get to read it in the span of a couple chapters, but this was months that she spent being faithful in showing this type of love. 
as we seek to head down the mountain and be women that put on the jacket of this kind of love, it's going to cost us something at some point. It might cost us blood, sweat, and tears for months on end. And while we are promised that God will reward, he's not unjust, there's not a promise that that's gonna happen this side of heaven. It may never happen. We may have to wait for our eternal reward, but there is a reward, and we must be encouraged by that. We must take courage from that. Consider Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. God is not unjust. He will reward faithfulness. He will reward his children who are displaying this same kind of love that he has first shown us. We don't always get to see it, but there is a reward coming. And I promise you that if you don't get to see it on this side of heaven, it's gonna be so much better. (laughs) To be rewarded by God in eternity is going to be so much better than any kind of acknowledgement or thanks or head nod that we can that we could get from any human recipients of our love all right well we've stopped at a really big cliffhanger (laughs) we've stopped at the end of chapter three boaz has promised to go do something Naomi has said that he will not rest until the matter is settled. So now we're going to hop into chapter four and see what it is that he does. You can put point number three down on your outline like this. Love by taking action. Love by taking action. Let's see the way that Boaz displays that now. Ruth 4.1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he, Boaz, said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of lamb that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, now this is the other redeemer in response, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Okay, so Boaz has just promised that he will go and have this conversation. And now we see that he takes immediate action in following through with what he says he was going to do. What we see going on here is that Boaz has essentially called the court to order. In those days, all of the uh, legal dealings, the legal proceedings happened at the city gate and the elders and the people of importance in the city would sit there and wait and see if anyone needed their participation in any kind of legal dealing. So it says that when Boaz sees the redeemer, he calls him over and then he gathers those 10 elders as well, basically because this is going to turn into a legal transaction, right? So he's calling the court to order. The next thing I want to point out is that we need to talk through what is exactly all of this detail about redeeming the land. Oh, and then by the way, if you redeem the land, then you've got to redeem and perpetuate the name of the dead. Okay, where does all of that come from? Again, God in the Mosaic law had given a command concerning if someone became poor and needed to sell their land, then the best possible scenario was that a family member would buy it for them, buy it from them rather. And then 
again, best case scenario, is that that poor family member would somehow be able to turn around their circumstances or save enough money to be able to buy it back. But the whole thought was is that the family would keep the land that God had given to them as their inheritance, right? When they came and they conquered and they landed in the promised land, and then there's all those chapters in Joshua and Numbers where they're dividing up the land amongst all the clans and amongst all the families. God wanted it to stay within the family. And so the best possible solution was that a family member would be the one to buy the land in the event that someone was in financial crisis, essentially. Where we find this is in Leviticus 25, 25. You can jot that reference down. You don't need to turn there. This is what God commands. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer, his nearest family member, shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. God wanted the inheritance that he gave to his people to stay within the families that he had given it to. And I'm going to take this opportunity to do a little plug for Dwell Richly. Because if you sign up for Dwell Richly and you participate in that Bible study, then you're going to get to go all the way through the book of Leviticus and not only behold God's incredible character that we see through the laws and the commands that he gave, but you'll also get to make awesome ties with the rest of the Bible like we've been doing throughout the last two days. So sign up for Dwell well, richly it's going to be an excellent study we have women's groups that are meeting on tuesday night wednesday morning wednesday night and thursday morning so hopefully there's a time that works for you because we would love to have you participate and study a book that we would probably leave dusty on the shelf for the rest of our christian life if we didn't have this opportunity so i hope many of you will join us for the new session of dwell richly okay so we've talked about the, the fact of redeeming the land. Now let's talk about this whole redeeming and perpetuating the name of the dead. Again, Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 6. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother for that his name shall not be blotted out of Israel." Okay, at first read, that's like, bleh, right? It's a little bit icky. But we also have to remember that God was not asking them to forsake the other laws and the other commands that he had given in order to keep this one. So when we're talking about this, we're first of all talking about an unmarried brother, a brother who didn't already have another wife. Second of all, for someone's name, for their inheritance to be blotted out was a horrible, horrible thing. That was a tragic circumstance to happen. And the rest of the family would never want whoever their deceased family member was to basically be wiped from history. They would want to carry on that name, carry on that legacy, so to speak. So when God gave this law, it's not, you know, weird, weirdness going on, but it's an unmarried brother who will come in and cover his late brother's wife, take her as his wife in order to perpetuate the name of the dead, and that would just be the firstborn son would technically be the offspring of the late brother. Scholars believe that at this point in time in Israelite history, and because there were like, you know, kind of all these contingencies upon like, well, it's got to be an unmarried brother and, and he needs to actually be willing to, to, to do this and to take his brother's, his late brother's wife as his wife. Scholars believe that it was then seen as acceptable in the entire family that whoever was kind of the next closest kinsman to whoever it was that passed away, that they should take, um, that they should take on that responsibility. So 
in Deuteronomy, we only read specifically about this being done between brothers, but what they believe has happened at this point in time is that because this was such a big deal and because no one would ever want anyone's name to just end, that any close person in the family that was like kind of next of kin situation could step in and act as this, um, this redeemer of sorts. We don't know what Boaz and this other kinsman's relationship were, was to Elimelech. But again, most commentators, most biblical scholars believe that they were either Elimelech's brothers or that they were his cousins. Or maybe one was a cousin and one was a brother. Or maybe this first kinsman was the older brother and Boaz was the younger brother. Something along those lines is what is the best guess as to who these people were. Okay, next, there's so much history to unpack here to understand what's going on. Boaz initially tells the redeemer, the first redeemer, okay, you can buy the land. So when he says, yes, I want to buy it, he's seeing dollar signs, right? He's seeing, okay, I'm gonna make this initial purchase of the land, but then I'm going to have this land to cultivate it, and now that God has brought the rain back, we're gonna be able to harvest, and this is going to be, turn out to be good for me financially. Another custom that was held at the time was that whoever acted in this manner would, if it was in the case of a widow, would also take on the responsibility of caring for the widow. So this man is knowing that he's not only taking on the cost of the land, but that he's now saying, okay, I'm also going to provide for Naomi by acting as the redeemer. So that was the first scenario. So then when Boaz says, oh, and by the way, there's another woman that comes with this, and she's Ruth, and you would need to marry her, and if you had an offspring, whenever you have a firstborn male, then that male isn't gonna be attributed to you, it's going to be attributed to the Elimelech's family. So at that point, the first redeemer reassesses the situation, pumps the brakes because, okay, now I have to take on the cost of the land, now I have to take on the care of Naomi, now I have to take on a wife, Ruth, and my firstborn won't even be mine, technically. That inheritance won't stay within my family, it will then go through this offspring. And so basically he counts the cost and he's like, I'm out. It's too, it's too high of a cost for me. I don't want to do that. But in his moment of backing out, we see Boaz come through and shine through because now he is putting action behind what he has said he was going to do. There is so much to say about how, can, how we can live out seeking to be a part of God's legacy of love by simply taking action, by simply being women who do what we say we're going to do. And just one small aspect of this is prayer. How often do we say, know that someone's going through a hard time, know that someone has something come up, something's been shared in accountability or whatever it is, and we're like, okay, I'll pray for you. Are we being faithful to do what we say we're gonna do and take action and follow through on it? Prayer is a great way to love by taking action. Any other way that there could be takes prayer. <laughs> it takes prayer and thought and intentionality to stop and say, how can I best show this person love? Like the sister who came and potted beautiful succulents for me. How can I best show this person love? How can I just wow this person? How can I love them by taking real action? By not just saying things, not just saying platitudes or like, you know, throwing out some encouragement, but actually putting action behind my love. It's going to be different in every scenario, but I think the best way and the first way that we should start living this out is by being women who are committed to pray for others. Can start with us, can start with our husbands, can start with our kids, 
can start with those that are in our circles that are unsaved, that we would be so burdened for them that we would actually be praying on a regular basis for God to save them. We can live out this love through prayer. Verse seven through 10. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. This was like the sealing of a deal. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malhan. And also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malhan, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So after taking a very brief moment, the author, to explain this custom, because even by the time this book was written, this custom of exchanging of the sandals apparently was already outdated. So he takes a little moment to explain, this is how they sealed the deal. This is how they made it legal. They took off the sandal. He drew off his sandal and he gave it to Boaz. And then Boaz has what he came for. He is now able to act as the redeemer. Woohoo! Wow. We got some aerial shows going on over there. <laughs> At the end of the section that I read, we already get this sense of celebration. All of the people that are at the gate now celebrate. They're excited because they see that God has brought together this worthy woman and this worthy man and that through it, they're going to redeem Naomi. They're going to redeem her out of this sad situation that she has come to. So put point number seven, or point number four rather, down, <laughs> number seven, wow, everyone's like, whoa, we skipped a few there. Um, put, put point number four down on your outline like this. Rejoice that you are part of God's legacy of love. Point number four, rejoice that you are a part of God's legacy of love. Let's continue reading. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. This is so incredible. Here we see the culmination, the redemption that we have been waiting for, the final climax on this upswing trajectory as we've been reading through this book. The women respond by rejoicing and praising God. In verse, seven, in verse 14, they say, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. They acknowledge that 
God is the one who has stepped in and shown Hesed and fixed this situation. He's the one that caused all of these things to work together so that Naomi's situation could be redeemed and Ruth's situation along with her. They give Ruth the highest form of praise by saying that your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. To equate one single female to the worth of seven sons was like the highest form of praise. Because as we know, seven is kind of a big deal in Jewish tradition, right? Seven is seen as God's perfect number of completion. And so for a family to have seven sons was seen as like the highest form of blessing that there could possibly be. Andrea, you've got a couple, a couple more to go. You, so you have a little catching up to do. Two, two more. What's two more? Hey, you already got five. Another two? Come on. <laughs> Seven in the family. Okay, all right. I like where she's going with that. She says there's seven in the family. <laughs> but they say this of Ruth, that she is worth so much more than even the highest level of blessing because of this hesed love. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is worth more to you than seven sons. It says in verse 16 that, the, that Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. This isn't like a wet nurse situation going on here. <laughs> this is like a way of saying that she became his nanny. We get a snapshot here of a loving grandmother doting on her grandson. She became the one that wanted to care for him. She became the one that was like itching to, to take him and babysit him while Ruth and Boaz hit the streets of Bethlehem, I don't know, for a date night. <laughs> I don't know where they went to get a falafel or I'm not sure. But she became like a nanny to him. She loved him. She cared for him as a godly grandmother should for her grandchildren. They named him Obed. And then we end this book of Ruth with surprisingly a genealogy. And it starts with Perez and it ends with David, the greatest king that Israel has ever known. And yet you and I know that the genealogy doesn't end at David. The genealogy ends with Jesus Christ. God used this situation, God used these people to display hesed to each other, for him to display hesed to them so that God could ultimately accomplish the greatest act of love that the world has ever known. God used Naomi to show sacrificial love. God used Ruth to show faithful, humble, obedient love. God used Boaz to show love that is extravagant and a love that takes action. And through their story, through the beautiful tapestry that he was weaving this entire time, what comes forth from this family is the greatest act of love that you or I could have ever imagined. Listen to the way that the Bible describes our Savior coming into the world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God used this family and this genealogy out of his great love for mankind to send forth a savior. And that savior didn't just come to die, to live and die in our place, he also suffered in our place. Isaiah 53, three through five says this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was this chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. And the pinnacle of it all is the way that the apostle Paul describes it in the book of Romans. Chapter five, verses six through eight. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the legacy of love that we have been adopted into. This is the legacy of love that we see beautifully woven out here in the book of Ruth. That God would send his son, his only son, to live, suffer, die, and then rise again. That we might be called out of darkness to walk in his marvelous light to walk as children who have known the greatest love story ever told. And not only that we know it, but we're a part of it. We're a part of that legacy. I hope you've had some time, I know it's been a jam-packed 24 hours, but I hope you've had some time to at least start meditating and thinking about and putting 1 John 4, 7 through 11 into your heart. Let's read that again. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I'm pregnant, so I'm getting emotional. This is the culmination of our first ever women's retreat. We now have an opportunity to head back down the mountain and to live out this legacy of love, to be inspired and encouraged by that love that we saw displayed in the book of Ruth and to know what that ultimately led to, our savior coming into the world. So it is my deep prayer and desire that we would be so excited to head home right now. That this legacy of love that we see here in these pages of scripture, honestly, from the Genesis to Revelation, is all about his legacy of love. That as we head down the mountain, we would let, let that legacy of love change us, embolden us, inspire us to go out and live for Christ as never before. So my dear sisters, let's put on the family jacket, shall we? Let's put on the family jacket and proudly walk out of here being ready to stand up and live out this legacy of love. Please pray with me. Dear God, I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful for the way that I see you working. I'm thankful for the way that you have beautifully testified about yourself to us in the pages of scripture. God, I'm thankful for the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, for the way that we see examples and each one of them displaying a different facet and a different aspect of your love. God, I pray that we would not soon forget what we've talked about and what we've learned in these pages of the book of Ruth. God, it is my prayer that we would walk out of here changed, different, inspired, emboldened, empowered to live for you like never before. God, we know that the love that you are calling us to is costly. We know that the love that you are calling us to is going to require sacrifice, faithfulness, humility, obedience, extreme.
extravagance. And so God, we ask you to please help us. We cannot do any of this apart from you. And so God, we ask you now to do that work in us. God, please let the world, let us see it in one another, the love of Jesus. God, I pray that this would be the start of a legacy for Compass Tustin women. God, that the retreat that happened just now, these last 24 hours would be the start of a legacy here. That this is not something that would die out with our generation, but that in decades and even centuries for as long as you tarry, that Compass Bible Church would be in existence and that the women would find time once a year to gather, to be encouraged by one another, to fellowship with one another, to corporately worship together, and to receive instruction from your word. God, thank you for the legacy that you have adopted us into. May we never forget the privilege of that legacy of love. Please keep everyone safe as they head down the mountain in the next hour. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.